Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Mentralysis, Part 2, Chapter 11, Visitor in the Dark. And this week we get a bit of a break, as the previous two chapters were really long, took about an hour. After editing to get the videos done, usually the raw video is for chapters like those is usually anywhere from an hour 20 to an hour 30. But with the magic of editing, taking out all the flubs, and there are plenty of flubs, you know, I'm not perfect. And taking out the, the moments of silence, like I tend to pause between lots of sentences. Is take those out. You, you can cut out 20, 25 minutes of video time without really trying. So those those videos are really long. This week, this is a very short one. So it's going to be in and out. It's a very short chapter, but critical information is conveyed to one Lord Cable of Blanchford. The Bloodstein books tend to be a series of revelations. We had the first book that was about this Parliament tournament, and then we find out that, no, no, it's not about a Parliament tournament. It's about an ancient immortal tyrant stealing body parts. And then this week, we might find out that that's also what it's not about. It's, it's about something in particular. Something is causing Queen Gome to be all hot and bothered. So, Let's proceed, shall we? Part 2, Chapter 11, Visitor in the Dark. Be cognizant of key information that passes and see if we can make some light out of this mystery and determine what really is at stake here. Some time later, Kay awoke. It was dark in his cabin. He had no idea what time it was. His gifts were still down. He had a miserable notion, wondering if they would ever come back. He felt there was someone else in the room with him. He thought perhaps someone was standing over him, or possibly sitting in the corner. He saw a flash of gems. He felt someone in bed with him, warm arms around him, and the heat of an intimate embrace. Was he dreaming? Kay? came a voice both near and far, whispering into his ear and dancing on his breath. Who's there? Leka? he replied, his voice groggy. It is I, Rothaba. Rothaba, I wanted to speak with you in private. I hope I am welcome to do so. Always. First, and with all my heart, thank you for being a friend to my Leica, okay? Rawl is wise and skilled, but he has much to learn about certain things. Hytath feel everything we do. Perhaps some things even more so. I simply hide it better. Thank you for your friendship. And for saving my daughter's life. He struggled to respond. Leica is... I know. I know. I should have put a stop to it. But she was so happy and it did my heart good seeing her that way. You love your knee, Countess. You are devoted to her. Yet your sleeping self is not so loyal. Asleep, you sought out Leica and took her r repeatedly. I should have stopped it. Be firm with her. Tell her how things must be, and she will understand and respect that. Rothaba's voice paused. Kay thought he felt her lips touch his. I have a number of fears. I haven't shared them with Raw or my other Hospitaller friends. It's just a feeling I have. Sometimes my friends are guilty of thinking too much, of relying on charts and data, not seeing what's unquantifiable, yet plain. And so I am afraid. With you, I can be candid. Afraid of what? That this is the end. One way or the other. Something is not right. My waking self, Queen Gome, knows of me just as I know of her. We do not, however, know each other's thoughts. She hates the fact that I exist, has pondered it, puzzled over it, wondering how the great Queen Gome can bear something so mundane and ordinary as a conscience and a heart. And she has tried to stamp me out of existence for centuries. She has cast spells and taken potions. She has mutilated her brain, yet I still exist. Her one true method of defeating me is to take her rest in protected places where the Mentralis' decks Broadwave cannot reach. She is adept at it. There have been long stretches of time when I have not been seen at all. I think she sleeps deep in the belly of her bower chest monster, near to all the things she has stolen. There, she is safe. However, a 
About a year ago, she stopped taking whatever safeguard she had been using in the past, and I began appearing every night to my hospitaler friends on faraway Hoban. Rawl attributes it to our people's tireless efforts to broaden the Mentralysis network throughout the League and in Zaffin space as well. He believes we have achieved a much greater coverage, and that could indeed be the case. But I, I don't know. I have my doubts. I have a notion that she wants me out amid my people. That she's using me for some sinister purpose. I've been puzzling over it. Many of the things she has done do not make sense. What things? Lady Crisania told me. Please understand, in all of this, poor Lady Crisania is trapped between us. There are two waking selves and one sleeping self inhabiting our body. I have told Rawl this many times. In the arena of the mind, Rawl has strong opinions and believes I am mistaken. He cites any number of medical treatments and statistical improbabilities, explaining away my beliefs. I am, however, not mistaken. Lady Crisania was the original. She, the waking self, and I, the sleeping self, born thousands of years ago in Bloodstein. We were in harmony together. She living the simple life she so desperately wanted, and me helping to inspire her in dreams. She did not understand her situation, her immortality. She was lost. Terrified, grieving over her dead loves, as our mutual immortality manifested itself, she sought the help of the sisters and went to them in Valenhelm, desperate for assistance. The sisters do not tolerate the bazaar. They did not help her. Instead, they imprisoned her there. For how long, I do not know, but I believe it was a long time, long enough for her to fall into utter despair. In her loneliness and suffering under the sister's heel, Gom came for the first time, riding the turbid seas of our inner psyche, whispering in the gentle, easily swayed Crisania's ear, promising to free her. All she had to do was relinquish control over our body to Gom, just for a short time, and she would be free. Crisania relented and Gom took over. True to her word, through ruthless exploits, Gom got us out of Valenhelm. However, her persona was so powerful, she never relinquished control, banishing Lady Crisania into the nether regions of our own mind, keeping her there like a bedraggled servant. Gom uses her from time to time, letting her have control in those select moments when she needs to feign innocence before discriminating staring eyes, and when she is blank and without senses. A terrible cruelty. The quiet, despairing woman you spoke with in Castle Blood was Lady Crisania, not Gom. If you had stared her, you would have scanned Lady Crisania's placid, love-starved mind, not Gom's evil, raging one. I am certain that what she told you at Bloodsting is what she believed to be true. After all this time, she still listens to Gom's lies, desperate for them to be true. Crisania still has some insight to the outside world and Gom's activities. Sometimes she tells me things, and what she recently told me I must share with you. A knock came at his cabin door. Kay, we're on approach! Kay blinked and Rothaba's voice continued. He could feel her holographic body next to his. Crisania didn't understand why Queen Gom would attack your knee countess and steal her face. Of course, your Lady Samadoran is very beautiful. She is a monoma, very exotic, certainly. But there have been many beautiful, many exotic women out there across the worlds, and beautiful men as well. And Gom has been many of them. Crisania told me Gom once took a fancy to the burrs of Tremble, a gypsy people roaming the countryside, very pale like your Sam. And there were the Doms of Carina whose dim world makes them very pale. She has worn their faces as well. And she has been Monoma too, long ago before she left Cana. She thought she would have free reign as the Monomas are so isolated and secretive, and she took their faces and attached them to her via surgical methods. The surgery didn't take. The Monoma's flesh is so alien. It... Kay felt her body shudder. It was a disaster, and she developed an aversion to Monoma flesh ever after. Crisania said she swore never to wear them again, a vow she has kept for centuries. Until now. So I ask, why is Gom suddenly wearing your knee countess's face? She 
has some sort of alternative purpose. I'm certain of it. What it is, I don't know. Another knock at the cabin door. K, re-entry, get up. K sat up and got himself together. The horrible perfume of the Horvath creeper that had plugged his head seemed to be diminishing. He tried sighting and, to his delight, he saw through the wall and out into the main area of the ship. He saw Sarah's hologram standing outside his door. He recalled what Rawl had said about the creeper spores embedded in his head waiting to snare him and sprout. He was eager to be treated and be rid of them. He felt a pair of arms come around him. He could see their holographic patterns of force. This is the end, Kay. One way or the other. I haven't said anything to Raw and the others. They certainly would not take it well. They would insist we pull back and wait. Let things die down. Though he hides it well, Raw is a very passionate person. All of my friends are. I cannot allow this to continue. Either I will be made whole, or this is the last time I will ever be seen. Gom or Rothaba, only one of us will survive this episode at long last. I'm sorry Lady Crisania is caught up in all of this. Should we be successful, I swear to share our body. My hospitallers will work day and night to give her time in the sun. You are our champion, sir. Mine and Lady Crisania's. I place my faith in you. To keep your wits about you, to save your knee, Countess, and to do what needs to be done, whatever needs to be done. I cannot depend on Ra or anyone else to do the right thing. They are too close to the matter. Are you asking me to kill you? If need be, can you be killed? Anything can be killed, even she and I. We shall meet again, sir, either in this world or the next. I hope there is a place for me there with my V-Helm. That comment touched him. He turned to see her. He had to see her, and there she was, glittering in her jewel-encrusted holographic gown. Kay embraced her, taking comfort in her Fenducer-generated touch. How could there not be, he said. And with that, we conclude the admittedly short Chapter 11, Visitor in the Dark. Kay gets a visit from Rothaba George, and she tells him a number of interesting things. She tells him that Lady Crisania does in fact exist, that she's not just a, a guise of Queen Gome, that she was the original. She was a very simple person of long ago, a hardworking person who all she aspired to was to marry, have children, make her mark as best she could, and then pass on. But she never did pass on. Her husbands, she had many, all passed on. Her children, and she had scores of them, all passed on, yet she lived. And she was terrified, like, why, why am I not dying? What is, what is up with me? And she went to the sisters for help. And the sisters, who aren't keen with stuff about this, they don't dig immortals. See book two for the answer on that as to why they don't dig immortals much. They imprisoned her in, in their fortress at Valenhelm. And they experimented on her. They treated her like a lab rat possibly tortured her and i have a no i don't i've never said how long she was there but i'm pretty sure it was a long time at least a lifetime or two that she was a prisoner and, and she was so meek and so complicit and so pliable that they didn't even lock her cell door knowing that she wouldn't try to escape because they told her not to escape and that she would follow their orders even though they were torturing her and in her despair she generated the persona of Queen Gome, unintentionally deep in her mind, a strong-willed, abrasive, sociopathic person who had the tools to get her out of Valenhelm, and she and she did. She like killed a sister and burned her and like put her on a cart and send her down. It was um I, I had it all written out and I was gonna put it in the book, but I thought it has really no place here. It was a pretty macabre exploit. She got out and then she that's when she began changing her identity, you know, switching from one life to the next. And eventually she she became a matriarch of the House of Blanchford. She is Kay's great, 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 great grandmother. And then she moved on to Zaffin space. So, you know, Queen Gome. I, and I did that. I came, I came up with that backstory because I didn't want Queen Gome just to be an evil mustache twirling villain just for no reason. When you have a sociopathic character, there, there needs to be some sort of reasoning as to why they're there, not just that's just how they are. And that's the reason that she was a generated pers personality, a, a sociopathic one, specifically 
to get her out of the sister's prison. And Rothaba also tells Gay- Kay that she can't stand Monoma parts because she tried an experiment with them long ago and it was a botched disaster and she developed an aversion to Monoma flesh. Just like if you have something to eat and then you get sick, you don't want that food again for a long time. It's like, ah, I don't want that anymore. Same thing. So why is she wearing Sam's face all of a sudden, making such a public show of it? Rotha even says there she has an alternative purpose. Why is she letting, basically letting uh, Rotha out, s- sleeping in places that the Hospitaller's Mentralysis Wave can get to her? She knows she's there, and she knows that sleeping in her bower chest defeats Lady Rothaba, but she's allowing it to happen. There is a specific reason reason why Queen Gome is doing this and nobody has put their finger on it yet. There is something that she wants. Something that the gods want. And Kay should have realized this a while back. It just hasn't he hasn't put the two and two together yet. So we will see as the story proceeds. We're almost to the end of part two. Only a couple chapters left. Next week, part two, chapter twelve, Helios Mason we're K, Sarah, and Leica arrive at Baz and come to grips on Baz with the Jones. Baz is a fun place. It's a wild and wooly place. I like to visit Baz in my, my stories, and they will be there. So, in the meantime, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out. Peace <laughs> out.